Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Good evening and welcome and happy Pride. This is Pride season. Uh, my name is Patty Coates and I'm the president of the Ontario Federation of Labour. I'm thrilled to see so many of you join us for tonight's election debrief and assessment. What's next for Ontario's labour movement? I will begin this evening's discussion by acknowledging that we are meeting on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. I am joining tonight from the Williams Treaty 18 traditional shared lands of the Anishinaabe people of the Beaujolais First Nations, Chippewas of Rama First Nations, and the Chippewas of Georgian Island First Nations. Land acknowledgements not only inform us, but challenge each of us to learn and understand Indigenous history, honor Indigenous diversity and heritage, and remind each of us that we are all treaty people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place and to every region across Ontario, no matter where you're located. We also recognize the contributions of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made both in shaping and strengthening this community in particular and our province and country as a whole. Now, before I introduce our amazing lineup of speakers, I'd like to share some thoughts and observations about the June 2nd election. First, Ford has no mandate for cuts. Nowhere did he or his candidates campaign on cuts, rollbacks, or privatization. When they bring back their real agenda, and we know at some point they will, we need to remind them and the public, we didn't vote for this and we won't stand for it either. Second, record low turnout is a sign of demoralization, not apathy. Ford won barely 41% of the popular vote, which is less than 18% of the total electorate. Millions chose not to vote, even though they were deeply angry at Ford's record. We heard this on the doorstep over and over again. These are the workers we need to connect with, to build their confidence, to join our fight, to show there's a progressive alternative to Ford. Third, a strong majority of Ontarians support our demands. Despite the election's outcome, we know that most workers support a $20 minimum wage, 10 paid sick days, well-funded public services, better access to a union, and so on. We can build on this support as we prepare to challenge Ford and as we organize fighting campaigns that can attract and mobilize the numbers we need to win. Fourth, May 4th helped prepare us for June 2nd. After the de demobilizing effects of the pandemic, including weeks and months of lockdowns, May 1st helped renew, re-energize and rebuild our struggle and put labor's demands squarely on the agenda. Without May 1st, and the weeks of mobilizing that forced us to reactivate our networks, we couldn't have done what we did for June 2nd. And fifth, despite the disappointing results, we are well poised to take on Ford. In defiance of the polls, we won more seats than expected, and the ONDP retained its position as the official opposition. Now, some pollsters and media were predicting a distant third place finish for the NDP, but the work of union activists and community activists during the campaign made all the difference in many key fights. We still have a lot of important lessons to learn, but we will use them wisely to build a bigger than ever labor movement. And on that note, let me turn now to our amazing panelists who will share with us their own unique experiences, insights, and lessons from this election period and help us figure out the next steps. So 
Uh, first is we have Jill Andrews, but I don't see her here just yet. I know she was having some difficulties coming on board, but uh, hopefully Jill will uh, will arrive shortly. And uh, you know we're really excited to have Jill uh, with us because Jill, you know she's she's a fighter and she was able to win her seat even though the polls said that she would not. So we're really, really excited to have Jill Andrews here to talk to us about you know, where we, uh, where, uh, how she won her seat again. Then we have Chandra Hazma is the ONDP MPP elect for Ottawa West Nepean and a well-known campaigner in her community who successfully defeated a conservative incumbent on June 2nd. Congratulations, Chandra. And we have Tanya Liu. She is a union representative and organizer with United Food and Commercial Workers and a longtime activist in many labor and community struggles. We have Patty Dalton, who is the president of the London and District Labor Council and a member of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. She's an activist and community organizer. And then we have Fred Hahn. Fred is the president of CUPE Ontario, a general vice president of CUPE's National Executive Board, a vice president of the Ontario Federation of Labor, and an advocate for working people. Please welcome all of our speakers. So for tonight's discussion, I will ask each panelist a few short questions and then give them about 10 minutes to respond. And then if any audience members have questions of their own, please. Um, please put them in the question and answer box, which appears on the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. When all of the panelists have had the chance to respond to my opening questions, we will take a sampling of questions um, from the question and answer box. So now let's hear from our amazing speakers. And I will just check, I don't see Jill on yet. Um, so we will then move to uh uh whoop, sorry uh we'll move to uh chandra and uh chandra um first i just want to say what a win and congratulations your campaign was the only one the only one in this election to defeat a sitting conservative so how did you and your campaign team do it like we heard from, well, we haven't heard from Jill yet, but you know, hopefully we'll hear the lessons that we can draw on from your experience and how will that affect your work as an MPP in the next four years, not only to connect with your constituents, but also to shape the ONDP as a whole. Thank you so much, Peggy. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's joining us tonight. It's my pleasure to be here tonight joining you from the unceded territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe in Ottawa, still riding the euphoria of our, uh, of our victory here, and very happy to share the story of what we did in Ottawa. Um, the story actually starts with a loss in 2018. So I was also the NDP candidate in Ottawa, West Nepean in 2018 and came a close second. I lost by 175 votes, which is a number I have repeated probably close to a million times over the past year. Um, this is a riding that had never been won by the NDP before at any level, uh, even in the 1990 orange wave of Bob Ray, uh, Ottawa West Nepean stayed liberal. But the close result in 2018 gave people the, the belief, the faith, and the confidence that the NDP could actually win. So 2018, despite being a loss, was the spark that gave rise to this victory. But in every other way, 2018 was an example of what doesn't work. So I was nominated about six weeks out from the election. I There was no fundraising done by me or by the Riding Association in advance of the election. I had no time to assemble a strong campaign team. And despite me and my volunteers working as hard as we could for six weeks, our number of voter contacts was quite low, just because you can't talk to that many people in a six week period. But 2022 was the polar opposite of that campaign. So after my loss in 2018, I never stopped organizing. 
even when I was still a bit raw and sore over the loss and talking politics was pushing on that wound, I, I never stopped. Uh, I volunteered with the municipal campaigns and the federal campaigns in Ottawa, West Nepean, along with many of the volunteers from my campaign team, which strengthened my skill set, strengthened their skill set, and expanded our network and the number of volunteers that we had. We did uh, local canvases pre-COVID, just on local issues, going out, talking to constituents, asking them to sign petitions. We attended local events. We organized our own events. And once the pandemic struck, we continued, even though we had to go virtual. So we never stopped being present in the community. We also never stopped fundraising. It may not be my favorite part of politics, but after the 2018 election, I turned around and went right back to fundraising. Uh, you can't raise $120,000 in four weeks, but you can raise $120,000 and more if you do it over four years. And raising that kind of money allowed us to pay for training. It allowed us to host those events. And it also allowed us to do a lot of spending in the pre-writ period with the confidence that we were going to be able to meet our campaign budget still. So I had staff working on the campaign, paid staff already as of February, because we knew that we were going to be able to cover our budget still. And the other thing that I did during this period was to assemble a very strong team. And this is another area where doing the work in advance uh, paid off. I was able to um, bring on one of the most experienced organizers in NDP circles who came with a very strong skill set and a very strong network. And this is another area where if I had waited until the last minute, uh, none of these people would be available, but I was able to benefit from all of their expertise and skills over the past year because I started early. And then I was nominated 14 months in advance. So I was already nominated in April uh, 2021. So I got to spend more than a year uh, officially campaigning as the candidate. And once all of these elements were in place, we were absolutely relentless in our voter contact. And it was every possible form of voter contact, emails, text messages, phone calls, social media posts, and most importantly, door knocking. We knocked on doors for nine straight months. <clears throat> we started when the leaves were still on the trees. We went through winter blizzards and we moved right into that heat wave of May. So we covered the full gamut of weather, but that allowed us to knock on every single door in the riding at least once and one third of the doors uh, as many as three times. And nothing is as important as those face-to-face -face conversations. I know there were uh, campaigns in other provinces in the federal campaign where due to COVID restrictions, they weren't able to do the same kind of door knocking. And I think, you know, my colleagues who had to engage in those kinds of elections will tell you they really paid a cost for not being able to have the face-to-face -face conversations because nothing replaces that face-to-face -face conversation for building a sense of connection and trust with voters, especially when those conversations happen over time and you're able to keep going back to the same people. And you need a really good team to do that because the candidate should be knocking on as many doors as possible. But, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not superhuman. I couldn't knock on 40,000 by myself in a year. And uh, last week I spoke to a voter who was telling me that her 98 year old mother voted NDP for the first time in her life after meeting me, but also that her whole uh, building of seniors voted NDP, many of them for the first time in their lives because she said, your team came through twice and they absolutely charmed the residents. They just loved you guys. Uh, the other thing was that in addition to the importance of those face-to-face -face conversations, um, our presence let people know that I was prepared to work hard, that I was going to put in the work to represent our community and that I was willing to fight for our community and to be present. So in the last week of the campaign, I had some people saying, um, well, I'm going to vote for you because this is the second time you have personally knocked on my door and I haven't seen any of the other candidates even once during this campaign. So just being present made a difference. And, uh, you know, as, as Patty mentioned, I come from the labor movement. I worked for CUPE for six years before being elected. And I see lots of connections between this kind of outreach and the kind of organizing we do in the labor movement. Just like we would never show up four weeks before a strike vote 
and expect to win that strike vote. You can't show up four weeks before an election and expect to win the election. And the other thing you can't do is show up and lecture everybody about your priorities and then expect them to vote for you. So what we did was actually not a heavy policy based canvas. We spent a lot of time listening to voters talk about their priorities. We let them tell us what was important and we talked about whatever issue they identified as important to them, even when it wasn't a provincial issue. And over time, a clear set of priorities emerged from the riding. And that's what I spoke about in media interviews and debates. I was amplifying the voices of constituents, talking about what was important to them, talking about the stories they were sharing with me, letting people know that I would fight what, for what mattered to them and that I was in this for them and not for me. So the key lessons that I would take away from from my experience of the past four years is number one, organizing is a four year job, not a four week job. Number two, fundraise early. So in the United States, um, they have uh, this political action committee called EMILY's list. Uh, and EMILY stands for early money is like yeast. It's really true. Uh, the early money that we fundraised allowed us to do a lot of things which gave people the sense of momentum, which also made them want to donate more to our campaign. Uh, it was absolutely essential to everything that we were able to accomplish. Number three, talk to voters as much as possible, face to face, whenever possible. And number four, listen as much or more than you talk. And this is the same approach that I plan to take into my work as an MPP, being present in my writing as much as possible, having conversations with, with people wherever they are at about the issues that matter to them. Uh, obviously, there are going to be some issues that I champion at Queen's Park, uh, but that's not the only thing that I will be talking about with my constituents. I want them to know that I'm going to fight for their priorities and the things that matter to them and amplify their voices and help them uh, to advocate for themselves and make a difference. So um, that it's me empowering people in the riding, not, not me as the important person in the riding because I got elected. And those are the the key lessons that I think are important to the NDP moving forward as well, and also to the labor movement, because as I mentioned, there's these connections with organizing in the labor movement. It's how we organize uh, when we're about to talk to the employer. It's how we have to organize when we're going to talk to governments as well. Thank you very much, Chandra. And you hit on some really, really good points about organizing and you know your, uh, your ground game. Your ground game was, you know, it was outward facing and, you know, you were listening to the constituents and what they need. And, you know, I think that's what people, people need, they need to feel like their issues and their concerns are important. So kudos to you. And we look forward to uh, working with you uh, as an MPP. So uh, Jill is still having some techni uh, technical difficulties. So we'll move over to Tanya. Um, our next incredible speaker. Um, you were the campaign manager for Felicia Samuel, the ONDP candidate in Scarborough Rouge Park. Now we know that Felicia is an amazing leader, trade unionist and campaigner who had a real, real chance to beat the PC incumbent, but ultimately fell short. What was your experience on the ground and what are the lessons you can share as an organizer especially from a trade union perspective and as a campaign manager for Felicia. Thank you, Patty. I noticed Felicia is actually in the audience. So I just want to give a shout out to our amazing candidate, Felicia. Um, yeah, Patty, you know, before the election, you said I, so I'm a union organizer. Before the election, um, I was actually working on a, organizing a cannabis store in Scarborough. One of the workers there, Jen, She's 20 years old. She couldn't afford to see the dentist. And then she had a medical emergency that costed her $2,000. So at that time, her coworkers were raising money for her so that she can afford the next month's rent, right? At the time, um, despite the employer's attempt to cut their hours, to threat to close the store, they did win the vote and they became UFCW members. And her and her coworkers they understand why they needed to vote for a government that's on their side. They saw it firsthand. And when I was before the election, when I um, was canvassing with Felicia, we met, we met teachers, we met healthcare workers, 
Uh, we met childcare workers, parents who are all burned out during the pandemic. And they were so excited when they saw Felicia, like finally someone that, that was at their doorstep listening to them, listening to their concerns and actually care about them. So, you know, after all, it was, it was not an easy campaign. Um, we were, we were still kind of in the middle of the pandemic, right? It was not over. Um, our volunteer base are, they're working people. They are, they, they work multiple jobs. They're exhausted. They're worried about their family. And sometimes it's not easy for them to get out on the campaign trail. So what I saw was the personal connection. Um, the, the, the volunteers that came for Felicia, many, many of them are teachers. And many of them told me they came because Felicia was their union steward because they, they saw the great work Felicia has been doing in the, in the labor movement. Um, they, some of them honestly may not, may not always been NDP supporters, but they came because the personal connection, because they, they believed in Felicia. Um, same like when we, when, I, when we do union organizing, you mean the policies, the statistics, they're all important, but after all, it is the, the personal connection that brings people together. Um, ultimately, we did not win the campaign, but we, we talked to a whole lot of residents in Scarborough Rouge Park, and we trained a whole team of uh, volunteers and campaign workers. Um, want to say, I wanted to say our, I was very proud of our campaign team. Our whole team is BIPOC and very young. Well, I, I guess Felicia's know this, and then I'm, I, after Felicia's me, everybody else is so young. Um, they, you know, we, you know, made sure we, people all had different um, experience and different skill levels. And <laughs> I see Felicia sending an emoji. Uh, <laughs> we all had different experience, um, different skill levels. Uh, we made sure it was a positive learning opportunity for everyone. Um, you know, everyone's included in the decision makings. Uh, everyone had important uh, area to contribute to. Um, on the other hand, what I think we could have done better is building locally. It was absolutely amazing, you know, these labor uh, canvases, when I saw all of you here, all of you came to the labor canvas is amazing, right? You came from all over the province, uh, but it's also important to build local capacity. Um, Felicia has been doing just that in the community in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, if any of you have been to our campaign office, you would have seen all those pictures of Felicia and, and friends canvassing, uh, flyering in the writing from summer to winter to summer. Uh, but she cannot do it by herself. We, we all need to be part of it, right? Um, I don't know if you've heard the uh, snowflake model for organizing. Like I talk to five of my neighbors. Um, I bring them on board. They each go talk to five of their neighbors. And that's how, you, that's how the snowflake happens. Um, it's always something I feel like we should we should do more, but we never have enough time to do. Like like Chandra just said, organizing is a four year job; it's not a four week job, right? Um, also, by doing this, we also make people take ownership. It's and that cannot be done just within thirty five days before the election. Um, the the reason we been organizing quite a lot of new members in UFCW is we let the workers take control of their own campaign. We make sure they understand it's, it's, it's your campaign. Uh, we are here to assist you, to train you, to mentor you. But after all, it's your campaign. You have the ownership and you are included in the decision making every step along the way. And we make sure they see what's possible. Um, I think Patty said at the beginning, part of the um, part of the problem in this campaign was demoralizing, right? Demoralization. People, you know, people people saw the problem, but people didn't believe was possible. Like a change is possible. Um, that's I think that's 
part of that's our job to to raise people's expectations, right? To make them see that we don't have to settle for this long, painful wait in healthcare. We don't have to, we can make life more affordable. We, the young people can have more opportunities. Um, same like when we're organizing uh, workers, you don't have to settle for minimum wage. You don't have to settle for all the all the abusive behaviors. We we make them see with the union, you can, we can raise your ex, they can they raise their own expectation with the union, is possible. So I would say you know we will have to we will have to continue to organize, especially when the government's not on our side. We have to continue to speak to our families, our neighbors, our coworkers, raise their expectations, make them see what's possible. And we can make the change, the change that transforms our neighborhoods and communities. Thank you, Tanya. And of course, a big shout out to Felicia, uh, incredible, incredible candidate. And uh, you know, you you touched Tanya on a really good point, and and that is, you know, the young members as part of your young workers as part of your um, campaign team. And we've got four years to build our campaign teams and get them activated. And I think, you know, uh, having the young people, the young voices, I know in my own writing, um, uh, it, uh, it was the young, you know, we had, I think we had the youngest campaign manager. He was only uh, 19 years old and he was absolutely fantastic. So, you know, I think that's, we need to tap into that youth, into that hope, um, into that, you know, that excitement. Um, and build, you know, something that's better and build something that's local. So uh, thank you for that. And I see that we do have Jill. Um, Jill, are you ready? Are you I am, ready? can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, I can't see you. Oh dear goodness, this is ridiculous. <laughs> can you hear Sorry me? about that. I, I can hear you, so I'm just gonna go with faith because I can't see anyone. <laughs> All right. Well, yep. I'm so glad that you're able to join us. Um, Thank and you for having me. And, you know, first of all, congratulations, a huge congratulations on your reelection. We're so thrilled that you are going back to Queen's Park. You ran an incredible campaign and you defied the <laughs> and the pundits. So oh, this is true, Patty. So tell us, Jill, how you and your team achieved this success in Toronto St. Paul's. In particular, what did you do to engage and involve community members well before the election period? And what Thank lessons you. could we generalize from your experience as we attempt to um, replicate your success elsewhere? Thank you very, very much, Patty. And again, it's, it's somewhat difficult to, uh, to communicate because I'm hearing you. There's a little bit of a, of a delay with the hearing, but I'm not seeing anyone. So I'm not going to be able to read the usual uh, cues as to when to start or stop, uh, but please feel free to cut me off. I know that we are with family um, on this call today. Uh, nonetheless, the first thing I wanna say is a, is a special thank you to OFL for hosting this panel. And I'd also like to say thank you to Rory Ditchburn and to Darlene Lawson and, and to Nancy and to Ethan and to Juliana, my staff team and Felix and Nicole and Zach and everyone, Billy, uh, everyone who supported us and helped us uh, make it to the finish line. It absolutely took a village. Uh, you are very right. Uh, there were many naysayers. There were absolutely many naysayers. Uh, you know, at times I didn't believe it was possible because, of course, you take a look at polls and you, you know, you take a look at what's happening even at the provincial level, you know, and you think to yourself, well, we'll give it our best shot, but who knows what will happen. Uh, but, you know, people showed up. People showed up. We had about 200 or so volunteers on the ground. Uh, we had incredible support. Uh, thank you to OFL. We had support from QP. Uh, we had support from OSSTF District 12. We had support from EDFO. We had support from steel workers. And we had support from Toronto Public Library workers and from folks who just came out 
from everywhere, uh, quite frankly, not only in our home here in St. Paul's, uh, but literally folks who came out of province, folks who were visiting from the UK who decided to support our campaign, and folks from different parts of the GTA. You know, uh, what I'll say is we, we started our campaign, I would say, uh, on day one. And on day one, I mean by June 7th, 2018, when I got elected. Uh, you know, we weren't campaigning, uh, but our stance was always to try to engage with community as much as possible. Uh, we were big on hosting events, uh, hosting summits, whether it was on housing and tenants' rights, whether it was on healthcare, on inclusive education, uh, on arts and culture. We always tried to bring in community as much as possible. Uh, we often canvassed outside of canvassing season, if there is such a thing as canvassing season. Uh, we often made phone calls. We did sidewalk visits uh, during you know, times where we had to be socially distanced. And we also kept up a lot of Zoom events uh, during the pandemic. Now, obviously we recognize that Zoom events were not able to be attended by everyone. Uh, there were folks who did not have uh, the, abil the ability to, 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 to have internet, uh, folks who didn't have smartphones. Uh, there were some seniors who, who weren't digitally literate, who weren't able to join us. So we know we couldn't capture everyone, uh, but we tried our best to capture as many folks as we can, as creatively as we could uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to read some words, actually, because I asked Rory and I wanted to, I said to him, I'm going to read his words because I wanted folks to hear it in his voice so he could get all the credits that he deserves uh, himself and Darlene and the team. And this is what they had to say. Uh, most importantly, in fall 2020, we started raising money aggressively uh, through our email program. And that meant that we had the war chest we needed to essentially begin our campaign early. Uh, this built off of, as a side note, uh, what we had done during the pandemic, and that was to create a newsletter that went out to uh, thousands of constituents here in St. Paul's. And I remember being stopped on the streets, uh, even outside of our community with folks saying, hey, I'm not even in your writing, but I've signed on to your newsletter. And that newsletter was an opportunity to keep people aware of what was happening locally in our community, and also to let them know what I was doing at Queens Park, uh, to let them know what other colleagues of mine in our NDP caucus were up to that we thought they may be interested in, and to also share really cuddly pictures of pets. And a shout out to Liz Glor Bell, because it was actually Liz who said, you know, Jill, uh, let's have some art pictures in the newsletter to boost morale. And then I think it was me or her, I can't remember which one of us it was, who said, let's get pets and feature pets of St. Paul's. So I can't tell you how many thousands of pets have been featured uh, in our newsletters over the last few years. Uh, but we did that and we really put forth a strong effort at keeping transparent and ongoing communication. Uh, going back to Rory's email from email fundraising, we use short campaign based emails that would always drive folks to a fundraising target and a deadline. You know, we did little cute things coming off script for a second, uh, like during my birthdays, for instance, you know, uh, Aisha would write an email, you know, on our behalf, asking for some fundraising, asking for volunteering if folks weren't able to fundraise, because we recognized that it wasn't just about the dollars. Uh, we had to target folks any way we can. And that was recognizing from an equitable standpoint that everyone couldn't give a dollar but some people could give up their time. And that frankly was even more expensive uh, than those who were able to give money. Uh, we started to build our canvassing program in September, 2021. It, it was slow initially, but of course it started off uh, what would be our building process, which certainly, uh, you know, it took off by March of 2022. Uh, we got an office really early. It was important to get an office early because we wanted to have a presence. We wanted people to get excited and know uh, that the election was coming and know that we meant business. You know, we wanted to have that done. Uh, we hired staff as soon as we could. Uh, we got VCOs who were really good and able to train our volunteers. That was really important. Folks had to go out feeling confident. And uh, even though they weren't feeling confident all the time, 
uh, they had to know what was our key message. And I'll, I'll just sort of wrap up here because I feel like I've been speaking for a while. My phone is now black. I'm looking at the time and I can't see anyone. So always feel free to cut me off if you need to. Um, you're, you know when you're okay, you've got just a couple more minutes. So that's wonderful, great. wonderful. And I'm rushing a bit because again, I don't know uh, what's happening and I want to be mindful of taking up too much space. Uh, but I'll say this, you know, when things started to look uh, a little, uh, you know, uh, disappointing at the provincial level, uh, to say it lightly, we really leaned in to what was our local and very personal message. And that was that Jill shows up. Like that's, that's what we tried to run our campaign on. That I showed up, that community matters, that I'm a hard worker, you know, what you see is what you get. I'm not selling you perfection because none of us are, but I could sell you experience, I could sell you results, and I could sell you leadership. And those were the three words that we tried to have everyone remember. Uh, that, and very intimately, we told our canvassers, we told our phone callers, we told our, you know, main streeters, if everything else went out the window and you forgot nothing else about this campaign, just be personal, be personable. You know, why are you here? Why are you supporting Jill? Why are you supporting the NDP? Um, why do you want to see us reelect me? And what will it mean to St. Paul's? And that was really all, you know? So I, I really think that um, the people who voted for us are people who believed in me. They believed in our team. Uh, they believed in our message. You know, we have over 60% renters here in St. Paul's. And I can tell you, the notion of bringing in real rent control, I spoke to so many essential workers. Um, I spoke to so many frontline healthcare workers who were excited about finally getting paid sick days, a real paid sick day plan. You know, we spoke to so many folks who wanted to see Bill 124 repealed. You know, I spoke to teachers and education workers uh, who were finally seeing some hope about getting the funding we needed in schools uh, to ensure that they could be safe and their students could be safe and, and we could have, you know, uh, healthy and sound buildings to go back into, you know, with smaller classrooms. People really liked what we were selling at the platform level, but I really do believe that our success came from just good old fashioned grit and from people showing up and us organizing as best we could, glitches and all, and just telling people what our truth was. And that was elect me, elect my team, because it really is a team. Everyone's, you know, I feel like this is our win. You know, it's a, it's a shared win, quite frankly. And we will show up. We will show up, we will fight as hard as we can, regardless of who's the premier. Uh, we will get the job done as best as possible for those of us here in St. Paul's. And I think that's really what it was. Right, Jill, thank you so much. And again, you. congratulations. Um, you know, I, I felt the excitement and you know, you're so right. It's it's about that organizing and you know, that's what we've been trying to, to do at the OFL, get that ground game. It's the ground right. game that is incredibly important. And uh, you did it and you were so successful um, you know, that constant organizing and constant fundraising. I think that's, you know, another another key uh, and building your volunteer base because that, like you said, that is so invaluable. Um, the, the people power is invaluable. Yes, it, it's people power. And, and you know, Patty, I, I want to just emphasize because, you know, everywhere I've gone and I, I, I know it's the same thing for um, every other MPP, you know, that, that was successful, you know? Everyone says, you did it. And oh my gosh, Jill, you're amazing. And, you know, your hard work. And I'm not going to short sell myself. Obviously, I worked hard over the last four years, you know, but I, I want to make it very clear uh, that this win was a collective effort. Uh, because I assure you, uh, there are folks out there who believed in me when I didn't even believe in myself at certain points uh, during this campaign, because we were hit with smear campaigns uh, in my riding. You know, we had a city councillor and a member of parliament who wanted me out of here uh, from the day I got in back in 2018, quite frankly. 
and they threw all of their power, all of their institutional weight, and then some uh, into uh, one of our opponents here in St. Paul's. So uh, make no mistake, the chips were against us. The mountain was high, uh, but I did not climb it alone. And I really want folks to know that. Uh, so there's no you here. Uh, we did it um, against the odds. But I got to also tell you that the average person was not looking at the polls. Uh, the average person was really remembering the experience they had with me at the door or the experience they had with the canvasser at the door, uh, the experience they had with my staff at the door. You know, that's what I think took us over the line. And we had an intergenerational team. You know, we had a team of young people. Oh, my goodness, I had kids 10 years old participating in our campaign, you know, and we had elders participating in our campaign. So it really did have that sense of a village, quite frankly. And I just want to make sure that that's clear. Great. Thank you, Jill. That's, Thank just, you. that's so exciting. We have a couple more speakers. And then just a reminder, if you have a question, please put it into the Q&A and you'll have an opportunity for your question to be read. Uh, to the panelists and for the panelists to respond. So um, we're going to move on now to, to Patty. Um, Patty is the uh, president of the London and District Labor Council. Um, you were on the ground mobilizing workers for the May 1st day of action all across southwestern Ontario, Patty. And you helped campaign in the London area during the election. How did may first help energize labor for the election uh, could we replicate these kinds of issue-based campaigns over the next four years uh, as a means to build a bigger labor movement thanks so much patty can you hear me i can hear you yeah excellent excellent and i've also been following the chat with great interest so here um, we kind of move over into and with Fred um, into the labor organizing piece and spoiler alert, um, we won our three NDP MPP seats um, in London and it was a fight, right? It was a street fight, it was a ground game fight. Um, just want to really mention, um, and I've, I've listened very carefully to all of the speakers, but Chandra, uh, just want to go go back to something you said that you never stopped organizing um, from the last election, most importantly, door knocking, um, including nine months before the writ dropped. And all of the speakers have really spoken about how that continuous organizing and engaging community and workers um, taking control of the campaign. That's what Tanya said. All of those things are important. Um, so the May 1st mobilization. So I think um, the May 1st mobilization was a really bold move by the OFL and all of us to energize and mobilize um, unions and community activists following a period during um, in the pandemic during which um, firstly we had unprecedented um, challenges. Speaking as a teacher, we faced like utter chaos and instability in schools. Um, with multiple stresses, including um, Bill 195, which meant the overriding of collective agreements. Um, and we were handling the effects of mass trauma um, for students and families and trying to teach courses in as little as 11 days. So we had across the labor movement um, unprecedented challenges in all the workplaces. And as a labor council president, I was highly aware of the cumulative stresses for unionized and non-unionized workers. And of course, and this has been alluded to, and I've seen this in the chat, we saw deep demoralization for workers and multiple attacks on unions. Um, the fact that the Ford government refused to pass paid sick days in the middle of a pandemic um, shows, I think, the extent of our struggles. And it's clear that in the labor movement, we need to give ourselves credit for this. First of all, we were fighting to save people's lives. And we did that. Um, uh, but of course, it was a huge um, historic trouble, uh, struggle. rather. We also could not use the entire range of protest pool, uh, uh, tools. This goes back to something someone put in the chat. Um, because of the pandemic restrictions, health restrictions. Oh, Patty, we are losing. Um, and although we did use some effective strategies. Oh, okay, Sorry. hold on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry oh, about okay, that, Patty. 
no, just, no, just, just let me know. I just didn't want us to lose you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, sorry, about, <laughs> sorry about that. So just to go back to the action plan passed at convention, um, which called for these mass mobilizations on May 1st. Um, and I think it's important to note the explicit focus on movement building. Um, and that was overarching. And of course, that's our, our task ongoing. So in the Southwest, we began months ahead of time with regular Zoom meetings of um, regional labor councils to talk about what we could organize and how. Um, and I think that the May 1st mobilization was a different model uh, in that we had local and regional events and actions, as well as um, the GTA and Queens Park marches. Um, and there were over 20 uh, feeder marches. Um, and also a positive feature was that labor councils um, were encouraged to decide on their own actions, as well as participating in the regional hub events. Um, and there was a focus on creative and unique actions, as well as rallies, MPP, uh, conservative MPP office protests, um, and marches. So, and then let's just recall that leading into May 1st, OFL organized an activist assembly by Zoom with over 600 participants, which was not only inspiring, but also, and this was really key, gave us um, a lot of time and space to do the planning for our regional and local actions. In London, uh, there was tremendous excitement and interest um, by community groups and activists since we had not had a mass action um, since the pandemic. Um, and they really, really liked the focus on May 1st, understanding the global um, element of International Workers' Day. So the day itself in London was a success with the largest number of participants at the main Victoria Park rally, which featured union labor leaders, labor council speakers and community speakers. And I had um, a lot of really positive feedback. And the OFL supports, I have to say, were really um, excellent. We got great media coverage and support with that. Um, and our key messages, labor messages were conveyed. And I also know that there was OFL funding across the province um, for various events. In terms of the regional hub event, uh, the one that I attended in Kitchener Waterloo, it was phenomenal. It was one of the best and most inspiring events, honestly, in my labor movement activist um, experience. And kudos to the Kitchener Waterloo Labor Council and to Janice Spoke Dawson, um, for the incredible organizing, gain a range of uh, labor and community speakers. Um, but I have to say what made it the most powerful for me were the indigenous musicians and performers. There was a huge land back um, presence and they were absolutely amazing. Can you still hear me, Patty? Yes. Good, yes. just checking, okay. Um, so overall, the May 1st mobilization speaking again, and this was variable, I understand, across the province, but in the Southwest, um, I think it was really important in reigniting our movement, um, building fight back with that overarching goal of building movement even beyond the provincial election. Um, election campaigns here. Uh, well, of course, credit to our talented NDP MPPs all of whom are clearly dedicated to major issues for workers and for all people, community. Um, Peggy Sattler's championing, I just have to say, honorable mention of the decent work um, uh, has been uh, incredible and attracted a lot of new people um, into our uh, labor and NDP movement, including I saw a lot of young women um, into campaigns. Um, and just to say, we've worked for decades to build our activist infrastructure. We have strong connections with the NDP um, from labor, and we have very strong riding associations, including in London Fanshawe, where we have both the M NDP, MP, and MPP. Um, we've worked for decades on that, and there are strong connections um, there. But again, credit to our NDP MPPs. Um, we knew we would have a fight on our hands in London North Center. Initially, we thought the Liberal candidate was going to, uh, uh, you know, um, be prominent, but ultimately it was the Conservatives 
Um, and a, a point made, this bears repeating, the ground game is critical. Um, how much do we do between elections? How do we engage people between uh, um, elections? And then how many elections um, can we have? And um, I know all of our um, MPPs, certainly Terrence Kernahan, um, uh, I think that's one of the reasons he won. He was out on um, doorsteps um, all the time uh, talking with people. And Terrence has a gift for making politics understandable to people, right? Speaking to them in their own language. Um, and uh, I saw many, many instances where uh, he was really able to, to connect with people um, on doorsteps. Again, though, OFL supports were key. The promotion of labor canvases happened in a way that I haven't seen before. And our best numbers were those the OFL um, promoted. Um, and it was so great to, you know, but for me having, you know, organized labor canvas on, canvases on the ground and then to get the email from the OFL, you know, reminding me <laughs> about the labor canvas upcoming, that was um, fantastic. Now, at one point we did see in London or center because that was the OFL priority um, campaign. We did see a climb in conservative report or support, sorry. Um, and um, we saw Doug Ford coming into London a lot, right? Obviously there was an emphasis on the Southwest, on London. We felt the heat, but we just redoubled our efforts um, on the doorstep the um, London North Centre campaign manager and staff were um, absolutely phenomenal. So I'm going to wrap up with, you know, kind of my key points. Um, and this has been said before, but bears repeating. Organize, 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 organize between elections. We and we in the labor movement, we've got to talk to our union um, members. We know they've been demoralized. We have to talk to them. We have to draw them in. We need to rebuild our movement. That is definitely the focus. That was the focus um, ahead of the May 1st mobilizations, ahead of the provincial election. Um, we need to focus on the next uh, municipal elections. Those are really, really key. We have to work with community organizations um, to keep uh, mobilizing. Uh, we need actions, and I've seen that in the chat, we need escalating actions, mobilizations, strikes. We know we're gonna have to have strikes, right? In the public sector upcoming with what we're facing. Um, and um, in London, uh, we've always had powerful connections with our community activists for direct action. Um, we need to engage in that training again, right? Um, so that we can use our entire range of, of actions and we can uh, give the Ford government incredible grief, right? Um, to win what, what we're looking for. We do have to address, this has been in the chat, worker demoralization. How do we continue to support um, and inspire? We need to build capacity. We need to build labor councils. Um, we need electoral reform. Right? What were the raw votes? And then what were the seats? That, that doesn't add up. We also need to address the negative populist messaging that's taken over regarding mistrust of government and politicians. How many voters and how many of our members have been influenced by these anti-government conspiracies? We really need to take that on. Um, and we need to do some a very, very careful and strategic education around that. Obviously, I think, um, and this was part of our OFL debriefs um, last week, we need more integration between the NDP um, with unions, with um, the labor movement, with our members um, and community, and, and that needs to happen um, between elections. So just in short, uh, I think this uh, session is um, fantastic. Bringing our labor movements, um, leaders, NDP, community activists together regionally and locally. Um, and I can tell you, we already that, have that on the agenda um, for the Southwest. Um, we'll have a round table and we'll be working on rebuilding movement um, in the summer. 
So um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. And hopefully you were able to hear me, Patty. Yes, I was. Thank oh, you. Good. A couple of uh, points um, in times, but um, it, your message came through uh, loud and clear. And Perfect. Thank you for all of the work that you did in the Southwest. And, you know, Collective I think, effort. <laughs> and I think what's really exciting is that, you know, people were exhausted from the pandemic. People were exhausted from Zoom meetings and being stuck at home and not being able to be on the streets like we you know, had hoped and wanted. And, you know, from our convention on, we had that excitement build and build to our activist assembly and then build even more working with community and, you know, and, uh, and the, you know, building locally and having, you know, the, the regional um, areas um, generate their ideas and how they want uh, to um, experience and, um, and, uh, you know, activate for May 1st. So I think that's what's really exciting. So thank you, Patty. Um, for thank that. you. So now Fred, Fred, in the months leading uh, to the election, Doug Ford began positioning himself as working for workers. What does the labor movement need to do as well as the ONDP to challenge that misleading narrative? What does it say about rising expectations among workers that Ford felt the need to speak to it? And how should this inform what labor does in the next four years? Well, thanks, Patty. And it's so good to see uh, Jill, who is uh, an awesome MPP. It's so great to see Sandra, who's going to be a fantastic MPP, and to see my colleagues from other parts of labor, and to see so many people active in the chat. Look, um, I'm going to try to cut to the chase, and I might not be as positive as some of the other people on the panel have been, because I think, in short, the labor movement has to get our shit together. Um, we tr lots of people tried really hard to do stuff here, but let's be honest with ourselves. The Ford Conservatives targeted the labor movement and went in to try to disrupt and separate us from one another, and they were successful. That means we have to have some very serious conversations with one another um, in our movement about our real goal. Our real goal is always our members and their lives and their futures and their communities. Um, uh, so much of what others have said applies to what we must do in our movement. We must go talk with our members. We must listen to them more than we talk to them. We must connect with them and reconnect workers to their organizations. Again, the pandemic broke so much of that. One of the things we experienced certainly in our union where we had, uh, had been building a list of historic activists over a series of elections when we went to folks to try to see if we could get them you know, more activated in this provincial election, we heard either, uh, I'm just exhausted and I, I can't do it. Um, not this time, Fred, I'm, I'm sorry. Like I actually called people up <laughs> and tried to talk to them one on one about this. Or we literally had folks who wanted to be released from work to try to do more and who were unable to get release from their workplaces. There's a huge staffing crisis that's still underway in much of the broader public sector where our members work. These are all challenges for us, no question. But, you know, there's so much opportunity ahead for us. Uh, Bill 124 is one example. I saw there were uh, notes about this in the chat. Of course, we must redouble our efforts on a campaign against Bill 124. The premier elect said just after being elected that he understands inflation matters to workers and he intends to be fair that we should be taking him on his word and pushing every last day until Bill 124 is repealed and until there's more investments in services as well. Uh, there will be uh, many opportunities for action, but certainly school board bargaining will present a huge amount of that opportunity and our union, we represent support staff, support workers and education workers in schools. We have 55,000 members who've been organizing, um, you know, toward their round of bargaining, which is just beginning. And, uh, and they are pushing hard. Um, and, 
and you know, I don't want to, um, nor should I, uh, be revealing their plans. But I can tell you this: they're not going to settle for a wage increase that doesn't keep pace with inflation, and they will push this government, and that includes mobilizing to take strike action. One hundred percent. Our job is to try to get as many other folks in our union, our hospital workers, our university workers, our other folks to be supportive and we and to bring community in to take that struggle, that particular struggle, and use it as another means to organize and mobilize to provide people hope. One of the things I felt most strongly throughout this particular election campaign was a lack of hope. People didn't feel as though um, uh, change was really possible. One of our biggest roles in the labor movement, whether it's around elections, whether it's around collective bargaining, whether it's about the organizing of workers to improve our collective lot, is to provide hope. Uh, and organizing and actually mobilizing together actually provides that hope, that coming together. So much of the way we did that was broken during the pandemic. I won't, uh, I won't actually say that we sat on our hands in the labor movement. That's just bullpucky. We did our very best to organize and mobilize in a whole bunch of different ways. We got uh, told uh, by a bunch of our members to stop doing some public demonstrations at certain points in the pandemic. These are all parts of our history that we can learn from, but our future is to go in some ways back to basics, going back to organize and mobilize and push. There's nothing there is nothing in the Ford Conservatives platform that works for workers. This we know, but we have to go back and talk to our members about that, help them to see, hear them about their concerns, really point out the ways in which what is really coming is such a risk to them and really help workers from the private sector and the public sector come together to defend our public health care system to fight for a better future. Um, it is, uh, it's not going to be easy, but it's never been easy for working people. It will be made easier because we were successful in keeping strong voices like Jill Andrew in the legislature, in adding strong voices like Chandra, but we need to have strong voices like Patty and the Labour Council in London and Patty and, and the OFL uh, across the province, folks like Tanya in the UFCW, our activists everywhere, figuring out ways to push for better um, and to just, um, you know, I don't know if people uh, need their expectations to be raised. I think people know inflation is taking a huge chunk out of our collective pockets. What we have to do is inspire in workers the belief that when we organize together, when we mobilize together, when we do that with other unions in our communities, but also with those who are represented in the legislature, uh, who are who come from our movement and who understand these issues, we can be successful in pushing back. We we had Ford on the run before the pandemic. He was booed by millions of people at a Raptors game. All of that can and will and must come back. And the only way to do that is by organizing together to do it. Thank you, Fred. And you are so right. That's you know, it's that, you know, building that hope and building that through uh, talking to our members, but also listening to our members and that they can feel that hope through mobilizing and organizing. And that is what our plan is uh, moving forward. So thank you very much, Fred. And thank you to our, um, you know, panelists for your thoughtful and comprehensive responses. You know, there's so many rich lessons that you have shared with us this evening. But now I know that there's a number of questions that have come into, um, uh, into us. So I'm gonna open it up to questions um, that our audience members um, have wrote. So I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa. Um, Melissa Bayon, she is our OFL Director of Political Action and Outreach to let us know some of the questions we're getting in the uh, question and answer box and in the chat. So, um, We've got about, uh, let's see, we've got about 25 minutes um, for questions. So Melissa, over to you. Thanks so much, Patty. And thanks for having me. And we're so excited about this panel. There's a lot of work ahead for the labor movement and I couldn't agree more. Uh, there's opportunities because there's no question. You know, we have 
uh, inflation at an all time high. Uh, I live in Toronto, people can't live here. Uh, we're, we're, everybody is struggling. And so we're gonna need to figure out how to find this moment and take it on as a movement and build from it um, as we are taking on future cuts of the Ford government. And that's gonna be a huge tension that we feel as a labor movement is a tension between building for the future and building now to taking on the fights that are gonna be in front of us. So, um, you know, to answer some of these questions, we had some really wonderful questions um, in the, in the Q&A box. Uh, and I want to uh, suggest that we answer the first question or one of the first questions is, what is the next step to defeat Bill 124? Um, and so I, I'd like to offer that question to anyone, if any of the panelists would like to answer that wonderful question that came up uh, earlier in the day, uh, you can raise your hand and, um, and go for it. And if, for those of you that are not familiar with what Bill 124 is, um, it's a bill that Ford passed um, before the election, uh, maybe a year and a half. Oh, no, actually three years. I had a baby. I've lost. I've lost count uh, to freeze public sector wages. But what's really outrageous, other than the fact that they've capped wages at 1% for public sector workers is that uh, it's in industries that are primarily uh, um, women worked. Um, so for example, police, men, police persons and firefighters um, have not, and doctors have not had uh, their wages capped. Um, like other sectors. So that is something to remember. So what is the plan ahead? And it can be answered by more than one person. I'm going to open it up to Patty, uh, president of the London Labor Council. Um, thanks, Melissa. And just to point out again, getting back to the May 1st mobilization, that was one of the key messages. And I think that um, uh, was prominent as far as I could tell across the entire province. Um, and so we got our, we were able to get our message out about how unfair um, Bill uh, 124 is. And I always go back to, we, we had a little um, uh, protest in front of Monty McNaughton's office as part of the series of events we did um, that day. And I'll never forget because there was a QP um, leader, and I'm sorry, I, 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 her, I can't pull up her name. She literally said, and I believe she represents custodians, she said that there are people, members in their local, who cannot afford their groceries um, and that their local mobilized to get um, members who couldn't afford to feed their families um, grocery cards and did um, and, and food donations and so on. And that really struck me because I think it speaks to the realities of when um, wages don't, especially for those, you know, um, newer workers, lower paid workers. Um, and I'll never forget that because I didn't know that before. Um, and so that is one of the outcomes of legislation uh, like Bill 124. So I think this has to be one of our, um, you know, key uh, focuses and demands. And again, you know, we need to do direct action training. Are the conservatives going to listen to us if they if we talk to them politely? Oh, no, I'm talking sit ins. Um, in MPP, conservative MPP offices across the province. I think that would be a great way um, to uh, get our, our demands won. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Patty. Uh, Fred. I'll just say that we need to rejuvenate a, a Bill 124 campaign in our union. We did a series of, we've done a, a three rounds of provincial rallies, particularly with our healthcare workers and hospital workers working in concert with the, S with the SCIU um, around healthcare bargaining. Um, we need to do this now uh, for all of our members uh, to try to uh, you know, continue to raise this issue. It's the one piece of legislation, and I know um, sometimes we shorthand things and we say Bill 124 and we, want, we need to explain it to each other, but it is uh, uh, the one piece of legislation that I think um, more people know about uh, as a result of the work of uh, so many who raised this before the election. Uh, but because the election's over, sometimes people feel like, well, there's not much more we can do now there's absolutely uh there's absolutely work we can do we need to go back to doing those kind of community-based 
rallies the kind of, and put every option on the table. Patty's talking about sit-ins and MPP offices. Sure, that's awesome. You know, let's have town hall meetings. Let's bring people together. Let's work with the NDP and have meetings and writings to talk about why the existence of this legislation is actually hurting our communities in an ongoing way now that the election's over. There's all kinds of things we can do and must do on that piece of legislation. And we cannot give up until it is repealed. There is, uh, you know, a, a legal action that is underway. I really want to recognize the OFL for coordinating over 70 different unions and associations uh, in a legal action that is aimed at challenging this uh, because it is a violation of the Charter of Rights. It is not unlike Bill 115, something the Liberals did to education workers, opening every collective agreement and ripping out provisions that had been there for generations. This is very similar. It makes it impossible, as people noted. It, this is not just about wages. It is about wages and benefits. We're trying at some bargaining tables. Employers want to augment mental health benefits for workers. They can't because of Bill 124. There are some very real world implications here that we need to make sure more and more people understand and apply pressure, uh, both political pressure, public pressure, and using the legal process because once we get this repealed, we must have a legal decision that makes sure that this, uh, this aberration is never taken by any other government again in the future. That's very great. Um, and agree, Fred. Uh, Chandra. The only thing I want to add to Fred and Patty's uh, very great answers is that we need to personalize the issue. Um, what little I know of Doug Ford is that he sees himself as the good guy and he does not like anything that interferes with his self-perception as being the good guy. And so stories like the one Patty told about people who are ending up needing grocery cards from their local union in order to be able to eat those are stories that we need to be putting in front of Doug Ford every day. Um, the, you know, the, as many stories as we can about the impacts that people are experiencing, the people who have difficulty affording rent, the people who are going without the mental health care that they desperately need because of this legislation. And, you know, Jill and I and the rest of the NDP caucus, we need you to send us these stories so that we can ask Doug Ford about them every single day that the legislature sits. But we also need the labor union to be amplifying these stories. I know it can be really easy to talk about structures and interest rates and everything. And, and that can be important to explain to people what the bill is, but they don't understand why the bill is bad until they see the personal impact of it. I have a friend from high school who is you know, a small C conservative, but followed me on Facebook because we had this relationship. And when he saw me posting things on Bill 124, he reached out to say, but, but I just don't understand why it's bad. And then it was when I started telling him the impact on people's lives that he got it rather than talking about 1% versus inflation. It was, it's, it's the nuts and bolts of food on the table and paying rent that people actually start to understand the harm that is being done. Melissa, Thank I think Jill, um, yes. Jill's got her hand up. All right. Jill, go ahead. Oh, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Joining on a cell phone. I tell you, it's fun. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add a few words as well, too, and say uh, that Chandra couldn't be more right. And that is what uh, we have tried to say for the last four years is it's not about the numbers. Uh, the government is very good at only talking about numbers and talking about, you know, what they've given and, in, you know, patting themselves on the back. Uh, but very rarely do you hear them telling the stories in the legislature during debates or even question period of real people who their policies are actually helping. <laughs> and that's because they're not helping real people. You know, uh, outside of developers, outside of, you know, the very, very, very wealthy, uh, there aren't many folks who have actually been able to see any benefit uh, from what Doug Ford has done. You know, in terms of care in St. Paul's, one of the first things that I've tried to do is just to ask folks uh, what was missing, you know, what was missing in the campaign. And whether it's mine, provincially, anyone's, what was missing? What took away the joy and the excitement? Because there was a lot of apathy. I mean, we saw the rates, uh, the turnout for voting was very, very, very low. 
And there are people that are really angry about that. And obviously it's frustrating, but I do believe that people had a right to say, hey, I didn't believe they made a choice. So it's our job now to figure out what can we do better to ensure that next time they will believe and next time they will go to the polls and they will vote. Uh, because sadly, every person that didn't vote, you know, and, and had very justifiable reasons why they were so angry, why they were so tired, they were exhausted, they couldn't vote, they didn't know where to vote, there weren't accessible polling stations. It was a vote to Ford without even knowing it. You know, it was a vote to help Ford. You know, and we've got to change that. We've got to figure out why did people not vote? Uh, what would people want to see if it could have been done differently? Uh, what did our platform have to do for people or say to people or make people feel that it might not have? I think we have to have really courageous conversations, uh, not about only what went right, uh, but frankly, about the challenges, about what went wrong. And not only at a party level, but at a riding level, at a MPP level, candidate level, we just have to have real conversations about what got what went wrong, uh, what did not allow people to connect, uh, what resources did people not get, you know, what could they have had more of, uh, what they could they have had less of. I think we have to have that really uh, deep debrief, frankly, so we can learn and build for the next time. Thanks, Jill. Uh, and so the next question that I think is very connected to your last uh, comments, Jill, is, um, is this one, building over four years and longer is crucial. And for the ONDP, the riding associations are the building blocks of that work between elections. What kinds of supports can be given to riding associations to help them modernize and build their organizing efforts even before they have candidates? That's a great mm -hmm. question. That's a wonderful question. Um, I'll jump in quickly and I'll say, um, writing associations need to receive um, as much training as possible when they ask for it. You know, I think writing associations um, are very enthusiastic. Uh, they are diverse folks, you know, uh, competing levels of experience in the political sphere. And I do believe that parties owe uh, riding associations the support. They owe them the support because they really are the backbone um, of any candidate's campaign. And outside of even the candidate, uh, they are the backbone. They're the presence of the party in the community, right? Uh, they need to have the information. They need to feel that there's a level of you know, uh, trust and accountability and transparency. Uh, between them and the party, they need to be heard. Their criticisms need to be accepted uh, without defensiveness. And there needs to be a way, a transparent way to work through when disagreements happen. Because when you alienate the riding associations, uh, it makes it really difficult to have a successful campaign uh, in your community. Uh, would anybody else like to answer that? I'm not looking at all the hands raised. Oh, Chandra, please. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Jill 100%. Uh, I also think we need to change how we do training. Um, I know there's been a lot of emphasis on Zoom because of the pandemic, but quite frankly, a one hour webinar is not enough to learn the skill sets that you need. Uh, like, I can't tell you how many one hour webinars I've participated in over the past four years, and I... I would have been ill prepared for the campaign if it wasn't for the experienced team around me. I think uh, training needs to be much more in depth. We need to invest in our people and build up their skills over time. Um, you know, we have far too few experienced organizers in the party. And I think uh, training and mentorship needs to be part of everything that we do so that we're, we're building a, a core team that can be uh, dispatch to writings when they need to be, but also that we're building up the skill sets of our activists and volunteers who are participating in the work of writings every day over the four year period between elections. Thank you, Chandra. That was great. Um, so our next question uh, is uh, regarding a bit of the United States. So I think this is an interesting question as well. So Bernie does a good job of rallying support for striking workers using 
very large and engaged email list, how can we connect the labor movement with groups like Lead Now, or um, for that matter, uh, lots of different groups that are out there as well. We work very closely with Justice for Workers that does on the ground campaign for decent work specifically, uh, that on campaigns on related issues, so engage uh, the labor movement with these groups so that we can build solidarity by supporting strike actions, like educating members on the importance of the strike and bolstering the union's narratives, narratives to help ensure uh, the, the win, they win the, the comms battle. So um, how can we do that a little better? I think is the question is how do we take on these issues? I hope that helps. Does anybody want to take on that question? Fred. I'm going to be short and sweet. People want, I really think people want a magic bullet, a simple answer, a something. And this is about grassroots organizing. It is about dedicating time and money um, to bring more people, to talk with more people, to build the base. Whether we're talking about the party and its riding associations, whether we're talking about our locals in the labor movement, whether we're talking about the labor movement uh, writ large, there is no shortcut. I really wish there was. There isn't. But there is something hopeful that can happen if we really make a plan and dedicate ourselves to actually doing this work together and just letting go and bringing more people in, in every which way, shape and form. And I couldn't agree more. We have a couple of hands and we have a few minutes left for one more question after this. Um, so I'm gonna let uh, Tanya and then Patty uh, answer that. Oh yes, Fred, I agree a hundred percent. There is no shortcut. Sometimes I see it in, in labor organizing. We, you know, we agitate the workers, we educate them, you know, we bring them into the union. After that, we feel like they're good, they're taken care of. You know, now they, you know, they're gonna have a contract, they're gonna have service reps, um, no more education needed, no more organizing needed. We'll keep them on the email list, so they'll get an email once in a while. But that's not the case. And if we keep, but the, the, the thing is also, if we keep empowering them, we keep agitate them, is it gonna make our service reps job harder? Because now they do realize what kind of power they have. They know to demand more, they know they, their expectation is raised. But in the meantime, it's, it's not. If, they are, they are, if our members are organized, obviously it's gonna make our job easier because they're together, working together. So I think we do have to, Freddie said, we have to let it go. Yes, we just have to let it go. We have to have the members have the ownership, have them know they have the power and give, empower them. Thanks, Tanya. That was great and agree. Patty. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like like um, I think people have been saying this um, uh, deep organizing uh, and that takes time and that takes resources, right? Um, we have to dedicate time to it. Um, I'm, I'm hearing Jane McElvey <laughs> here, there are no shortcuts to the deep organizing, right? Um, so we have to figure out how we're going to do that. And getting back to Jill's questions, um, why was voter turnout so low, right? We've got to get at that with our union members. Obviously, we had a chunk of union members. Um, and, and I had that conversation earlier today, Melissa, in our, um, you know, kind of pre-organizing meeting. How do we get at that? What was going on? What was in the minds of our union members? Um, were they believing in the conspiracies about, you know, you can't trust government, et cetera? We really have to get at that. And we have to do some education as well. So deep organizing for sure. But yeah, like Jill, I think you're totally right. Um, you know, those were our members that didn't vote as well. And why didn't they? We've, we've got to get at that piece. Um, and, and that's interconnected with the, the deep organizing. We have to have the more, more resources, more money, time, and um, uh, people to do that, right? Thanks. Thank you, Patty. And the last question, um, and hopefully, we, perhaps we have one answer because we are close in time. Uh, for the labor for labor to have real influence within the NDP, the trade union movement must be more involved within the party. 
Uh, do you agree that the trade union movement be, become more involved in the ONDP? Uh, and that's very yes or no answer, but you could elaborate. <laughs> Chandra. So in my own writing, it'd be hard to imagine the labor movement being any more involved than they already were. Uh, we had a labor candidate. Uh, we had a campaign manager who was the chief steward of his union. Uh, we had so many canvassers and volunteers who came from the labor movement, from OSSTF, from ETFO, from QP, from UFCW. Uh, you know, labor was a huge part of the campaign. Uh, at least half of my writing association executive, if not more, is from the labor movement. Uh, so, you know, what I can say is that when labor is involved together, we are incredibly successful. And if uh, you are from labor and you're not involved in your local writing association, I encourage you to become involved. And if you're on a writing association executive and you don't have connections with labor, please reach out. Um, because together we are so much stronger and, and, and we accomplish so much more together. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the panelists. I'm going to turn it over to, oh, Patty, did you put your hand up? I'm so sorry. I didn't see it. Go ahead. It's okay. And I'll be quick. Um, just want to say this was part of a couple of the debriefs last week as well, um, that the conservatives did, um, strategic outreach to specific unions, um, and the point's been made, I've, I've heard it a few times, uh, that the labor movement, OFL, needs to be involved on the ground level more. Oh, we lost um, with the NDP, again. Oh. Um, with their platform and, and, you know, oh, okay, I'll, I'll stop talking now. Sorry, <laughs> I think Patty. I made my points. So I hope you were able to, yeah, no, it's okay. I, I hope you were able to hear it. Okay, yeah, thank you. You made an excellent point. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, to Patty Coates, president of the OFL to wrap up the evening. And thanks for answering the questions. And the last thing I'll say is we didn't get to all the questions, but if you want your, ans your question answered, you can send an email to info at ofl.ca and we'll make sure to get you an answer. I apologize, we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, and it's a very lively chat, which is a good thing. Uh, and so we'll get to your question later on today and I'll put that in the chat. Patty, go ahead. Thank you, Melissa, for facilitating uh, that uh, uh, Q&A. Um, and it's really important to know that, you know, the, the OFL is inserting themselves into um, the uh, ONDP even more so, it will continue to do that. We have done that throughout the, uh, the past four years, um, building relationships with the MPPs uh, and the party, and we will certainly continue to do that. Um, and I wanna thank everyone who shared their own questions um, during the uh, tonight's meeting. And, uh, and if you want your questions answered, please do uh, reach out to us. Um, we're so happy that you all joined us for this important debrief and assessment, and we look forward to more opportunities to discuss the next step and build the movement against Ford's agenda, because this is not the last conversation that we're going to have. Indeed, we're, we are already well on our way and we'll be developing plans in the next coming weeks and months, including how the labor movement can engage in the upcoming ONDP leadership campaign. This will be another opportunity for uh, trade unionists, community members, and the wider movements to uh, assert their vision for the kind of Ontario uh, workers need and deserve. And as we said during the May 1st mobilization, the fight for a workers' first agenda in Ontario does not stop with the election. That fight has to be an ongoing one, and we're hopeful about what all of us can achieve in the next four years as we continue to build our movement for a better Ontario. Now, before we conclude, I'd like to say again, happy Pride season uh, and encourage all of you to check out the comprehensive list of the 2022 20, uh, Pride events all across Ontario. You can find that on our website. Um, it links to the local Pride actions and celebrations and events that are taking place between May and September, because Pride isn't just a month. That might be a uh, Pride month in Toronto, but it is a Pride season all across Ontario in 
so many um, locations. So watch for the link in the chat or visit OFL.ca. So thank you again to our amazing panelists for your incredible contributions tonight and sharing your evening with us. Thank you to our amazing staff and those working on the tech support for tonight's meeting, especially our captioners. And a final thank you to all of you, each and every one of you for joining us from across Ontario. See you at the next event. Have a great evening. Solidarity.